so let's get into it. So, we'll start with Euler's number. Um, I don't think the R is meant to be though, but oh well. Um, so, Euler's number. Um, it's pronounced Euler, like O-I-L-E-R. Um, but what it is, is just E, right? So maybe you guys have seen that before. So, yeah, I don't know where the R, R was there. Anyways, it's um, E is called Euler's number. Um, it's like pi um, in the sense that, you know, it's a it's an irrational number that's constantly repeating. Um, it's a good idea to remember it to a rough decimal point. So like how we remember that pi is about 3.14. Uh, it's just knowing um, E to about, you know, two sig figs or three. So 2.718 is probably good enough or 2.72 is probably reasonable. Only reason I recommend knowing it is for exam one, you might be asked um, some questions, you know, involving E, but most times you don't actually have to use E at all. Um, and you, well, you don't have to use a decimal value of E at all. And often you can just express it as E. So E is super, um, like, yeah. Another thing to note is that E like pi is a, is a number. It's not a variable to, to be solved. Um, but E is really important when it comes to exponentials and logarithm functions. Okay. So before we get on to exponentials, um, we're going to sort of touch on, on your, you know, index laws. So index laws are generally a basic concept, um, and I think it's something you guys would have covered in year 10, um, and these are basically it, so I'll quickly run through them, uh, but I don't want to spend too much time here, um, because, you know, it's fairly simple. Um, if you aren't familiar with your index laws, that's all good, just make sure you revise them, um, and, you know, if, there, if, there's not any, if there's anything you don't understand, just send a question in chat. So... When we have two indices of you know the same like base but different powers multiplying together, what we do is we just add their powers, right? Relatively simple. If we're dividing them, we can subtract their powers, right? But it's also important to note that if anything is like one over you know n, we can just rep represent that as a to the power negative n, right? So as shown here. So really, what's happening here is a to the power m times a to the power negative n which is just a to the power m minus n, right? Reasonably straightforward. Something to remember, though, is that a to the power 0 is 1, okay? Um, I think a lot of people sort of um, mess this up and write down a to the power 0 is 0. Reasonable mistake to make. However, it's really important that we don't make this. And, you know, a to the power 0 or anything to the power 0 pops up a lot because um, I think BCAA knows that's a point students struggle with. Um, and so they like to trick students up. And if we have a fraction, that fraction is, you know, the, the something root of it. Like maybe it's the cube root if the, fr the fraction is a three. So if you have something like a to the power one half, that's the square root of a. If you have a to the power one third, that's the cube root of a, right? Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, if you've got like a indice like this, the m multiplies in, so here you're still left with a to the power m over n, okay? Um, I'll give you guys a couple seconds to have a crack at this question here. Here is the solution, but I'll walk you through step by step. Um, so what we're doing is we're solving the equation for 2 to the power 3x minus 3 is equal to 8 to the, to the power 2 minus x. So what's really useful for these questions is that you want to make them the same base, right? What I mean by the same like base or base value is this, this, right? You want to make these two the same, right? So you've got two to the power three X minus three. We want to make eight to a similar form, right? Eight is equal to two to the power three. So we can do that, right? So we've got two to the power three times two minus X, right? And then we just simplify from here. So two to the power three X minus three, that's equal to two to the power six minus three X, okay? Now we can just get rid of these, right? Because the because the base is the same, this sort of implies that the powers must be equal, right? So we can use that. So 3x minus 3 is equal to 6 minus 3x. Knowing this, this is a relatively trivial sort of thing to solve. So we rearrange for 3 and isolate everything as we usually do. So we want to isolate the x's from the normal or the, the non-x multiplied variables. So we'll get 6x. So what I'm doing here is just adding 3x to both sides, we get 6x, and then I'm going to add 3 to both sides as well. reason I add 3 is because I want to remove the 3 from here and move it to there, right? So we get 6x is equal to 6 plus 3, which is 9. So I've got 6x is equal to 9, 
Therefore, x is equal to 9 over 6. I simplify it by dividing the 3 out. That will just give me 3 on 2. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, another really important thing to know before we get into all of this stuff is a little bit of a recap of what um, domain and ranges are. Right. Easiest way to remember them, I think, is domain relates to x values and range relates to y values. Right. Another way to also think about it is range is the output of a function. The domain is the input of a function. Right. So we can say that the maximal domain of you know of an exponential, right, is r. Right. So exponentials are generally in the form of y is equal to a to the power x. And since x, you know, because as we saw earlier, right, x can be anything, right, with the indices law, x can be anything, right? So we can just say, um, you know, the maximal domain is r, right? So x is an element of r for a maximal domain. However, the range is only from 0 to infinity. Why? Well, if I have x is equal to 0, right, and y is equal to 1, if I have x is equal to negative 1, y is equal to 1 over a. Right? And as x keeps decreasing, this keeps getting larger. Right? So if I have x is equal to negative 2, y is equal to 1 over a squared. And so as x keeps getting lower, a um, keeps getting lower as well, right? because the denominator keeps increasing and y keeps approaching 0. Right? So as a gets bigger, so as the denominator gets bigger, so a, as a you know, approaches infinity, right? y, you can also say y approaches 0. Right. No x value for an indice will result in a negative value, more or less, is the point I'm trying to get at. So the range for you know some basic exponential is from zero to infinity. Okay. Um, so like I mentioned, an exponential is generally in the form of y is equal to ax, but we can also apply some transformations to it. So we can apply a dilation factor and some translations here as well. Okay. Um, our exponential has a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to d. So for those of you who've never accounted the word asymptote before, um, an asymptote is a value that the graph cannot be equal to. Right? For example, um, this here is an exponential. What happens at this end right, is that as um, x keeps increasing you know, this way, the value keeps getting closer and closer to its asymptotic value, but it will never reach it. Okay. So for an exponential, the asymptote is always at y is equal to d. Okay, so why does this asymptote exist, right? So let's think of a case where, you know, let's assume that somehow y is equal to d, right? So I'm going to substitute that into my original exponential equation here. So we've got d is equal to a times b to the power x plus c plus d, right? I'm going to sort of just um, simplify this, cancel the d's out, go on with life. So we've got 0, so I've just subtracted d from both sides. So 0 is equal to a times b to the power x plus c. Now I'm going to divide by a, um, so I'm left with b to the power x plus c is equal to 0. Okay, let's have a think. Is there any number that exists, right, that's raised to some power that's equal to 0? Right, let's look at a simplified case, right? Let's look at 4 to the power, let's say capital A. Right, when you guys to think of any any reality that this is true, just choose any value for a and try to think if that equals zero. Right, um, you know if if you guys can think of any exceptions that or any value for a that can make this equal to zero, throw them in chat. Um, but I'm fairly confident and fairly certain that no value for a exists in the real number plane. Right, so no real exponential value. Um, can make 4 to the power a equals 0, right? So this is not possible, right? So we say it's not, it's not equal, right? So then therefore, at y is equal to d, we get an asymptote because our exponential function just can't equal 0, right? And so the reason it approaches this asymptote is sort of what I mentioned earlier, right? That denominator is key, is, um, oh, I realize that's cut out of the frame. Um, I'll redo it again. So, so why does a graph approach this asymptote, right? So let's take a simple case of y is equal to 
a to the power x, right? So let's say x is equal to um, negative 1. We'll get y is equal to 1 over a. Let's say x is equal to negative 2. We'll get y is equal to 1 over a squared. Let's say x is equal to negative 3. We'll get y is equal to 1 over a cubed. And so as you guys can see, as x approaches negative infinity, right, y is going to approach 0. Why does that happen? Because, you know, the, the larger a number that we divide at the bottom, the closer this value is to 0, right? the smaller that fraction is. So that's why it approaches the asymptote, okay? Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, though. I realized it did get cut out um, on, on this slide, but it's basically just the same information I've presented here. So yeah, sorry about that, I didn't really notice. Um, but yeah, um, you don't really miss out on anything. Um, that's just um, what I showed earlier. Cool, so hopefully that makes sense as to why this asymptote exists and why the graph approaches this asymptote. Um, all right, so here we go. This is just a simple exponential. I'll just sort of get um, rid of, oh, I'll get rid of everything in the way. Uh, it's not letting me. Sorry, my bad. Um, the screen wasn't working for some reason. Let's quickly get rid of all that stuff. So we can see that this is just, you know, basic exponential. We've got y is equal to 2x, right? We can see that we just solve for its intercept as usual. So we, I did y is equal to 0. And I got, um, oops, sorry. Um, I did x is equal to 0, sorry. And I got y is equal to 2 to the power 0, which is just 1. Right, so that's how I found my uh, y-intercept, and you know, relatively straightforward. We can see that it has an asymptote here. Right, it's approaching some value. Um, hopefully, you guys can sort of guess what value that is. But in this case, it's the the d value is just zero. Right, so the asymptote here is at the line x is equal to zero. Okay. So, in the the above graph, right. So generally we have b from 0 to 1, right? So how does this affect the overall form of graph, right? So how does b being from, you know, in between 0 to 1 affect how our graph looks, right? So um, here we sort of considered when b is greater than 1, right? Um, you know, it just looks, it goes upwards, right? What about if it was uh, less than 1? So let's think about y is equal to 1 half of x. Right, so we can pretty easily transpose that into 2 to the power negative x. So this causes a reflection in the y-axis, right? It's a change in x, right? So I'm going from up here on the top, I'm just reflecting it to the bottom, right? So really what I would expect, if I go back onto the last um, uh, slide, I'd expect something like this, right? Um, with a intercept here at maybe zero comma negative one, right? Um, but yeah, that's more or less it. Cool, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so if B is less than one, all you have to do is just rearrange it so that the, you know, use your indices laws, put the negative at the top and you stop it from being a fraction, it becomes reasonably clear what that graph would have been. Okay, let's have a crack at trying to sketch these. So the way that we sketch these is first we find the horizontal asymptote, which is given by you know what d is equal to, um, and then we want to find the axis intercepts, right? So you know what the y y axis intercept is and what the x axis intercept is. Um, there's only one axis intercept. Um, we want to choose like a scale point, and that's a scale point is, you know, any point that the graph goes through, and we can use that to, you know, set the scale um, of our x and y axes. So in this case, um, in the case from this, we have one, right? So ideally, you do your um, scales in units of, you know, per one or something. As long as you're consistent, that scale doesn't matter too much. Then you want to sort of figure out its shape. What I mean by the shape is, you know, is it going up like this or is it going down like this, right? Or maybe it's decreasing like that, right? Um, or it's 
or it's going up like that, right? So you want to try to work out what its shape is, okay? You can do that based on reflections and talk about that a little bit more. And after that, you want to sketch, double check, and include that, um, you know, make sure you've included everything you need to. Because sometimes the question will be like, um, include um, like a label the horizontal asymptote, label the intercept, or sometimes it won't, right? So you just got to make sure what the question wants and then you make sure that you've answered the question in its entirety. Okay, let's have a crack at sketching this um, exponential. So first thing I noticed is that it is less than um, one, right? So I'm going to convert it into this, four to the power negative x minus two, right? Then I'm going to determine its asymptote. Its asymptote or its value for d in this case is negative two. So the asymptote is at negative two. Right, so I'm just going to draw in my asymptote here. So x is equal to negative two. Right, then I can work out my intercepts, right? So let's say I have an intercept of um, x is equal to zero, right, my y-intercept. So y is equal to four to the power um, zero minus two, which is just equal to um, one, uh, minus 2, which is equal to uh, negative 1, right? So I'll have an intercept here, negative 1. Okay, um, what else can I sort of note about this? So let's see if I have any x intercepts, right? So we're going to set y is equal to 0. So 0 is equal to 4 to the power negative x minus 2. And 2 is equal to 4 to the power negative x. So how do I work out what this is, right? Same thing, just make it equal, you know, make it, make the same basis, same thing as earlier, sorry. We use, um, we equate the bases, sort of work it out like that. So two to the power one is equal to two. So four is equal to two squared, right? So I've got two to the power two times negative x. And so now I have one is equal to negative two x and x is equal to negative one over two. So I have an intercept here, right? So here I have intercept at negative one half, comma, um, have I done this incorrectly? No, negative one half, comma, zero. And here I have um, zero, comma, negative one. Cool. And so my graph, um, knowing the shape from earlier, is going to look a bit like this. It's gonna approach the asymptote as well. It's gonna use this. There we go. That is my graph there. So that's y is equal to 4 to the power negative x minus 2. Okay, um, I think I just realized that I might have done the earlier example incorrectly. So I think I'll sort of quickly talk about this. Um, so the graph from this example, so I said um, the example was y, so the example was y is equal to 1 over 2 to the power x. I said that the graph would look like this, but I think I was incorrect um, in saying that, so I'm going to quickly correct that. So um, I'll just get rid of all these annotations here. So if we try to graph the graph y is equal to um, 2 to the power negative x, right, we should note that it has the same y-intercept. I'm not sure why I made the mistake of calling it 0 comma negative 1, but really if we solve for it, so if we do y is equal to um, sorry, if we do x is equal to 0, we'll get y is equal to 2 to the power of 0 as well. That's just equal to 1. The only thing that changes in this graph, right, um, let's get rid of this as well here. The only thing that changes um, when we do the, when, when b is less than 1, is that it doesn't, sorry, it doesn't change from here to here. It changes like sort of from here and it, it flips to the other side like so. So it would have been like this, right? It's my bad. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully that clears up any confusion anyone had. Um, sorry about that. Okay, another thing to note with exponentials before we move on is growth versus decay, right? So clearly these are some different sort of forms we can have. Um, if I've got y is equal to, I'm just going to go a, b, x, plus c, plus d, right? If I have 
um, a graph that's like y is equal to negative bx. Let's just do that for simplicity, right? Now my graph is going to look like this. So um, if I have my x-axis like this, my graph is going to go down, right? If I have y is equal to b to the power negative x, it's going to decrease like this. If I have y is equal to the power y is equal to b to the power x, now I've got a normal exponential. So two ones that are of key interest are the two that look like this, right? the one that increases like so, the one that also decreases like this. Right? Now these are reflections in the y-axis and they're particularly interesting because this one here shows exponential growth. right? And this graph here shows something we call exponential decay. And so for those of you do who those of you who do physics, um, you've probably encountered this before with nuclear decay and half lives and et cetera. So it's a really common question type you can get with this. Um, they can ask you to model the half-life or calculate the half-life of something um, using this sort of um, equation. Okay, let's get on with log laws. So, you know, now that we're reasonably confident with graphing exponentials, we can take it up a notch and start doing logarithms. So before we do uh, logarithms, there are a few laws to know with logs, right? So what is a log, right? So we'll start there. Um, with a logarithm, if I have, you know, something like well, the, a log is like trying to answer a question, right? In particular, so if I have a to the power b is equal to c, right? If I take the logarithm of c with respect to a, so logarithm of c base a, right? It lets me find b, right? So a logarithm, right, has the starting, um, you know, the starting base and the final value, but it wants to know, right, what it, what, it, what it's going to tell us is the power we had to raise that number to to get the final number, okay? So that's important to understand what a log is actually trying to calculate. We'll do a couple questions as well to sort of get the hang of it. So here we have log base a. So the first law is log base a of m to the power p can be sort of simplified by just basically taking that, that p and placing it at the front like this. Okay. The second one is when we, do, when we um, subtract two logs of the same base, um, what we do is we divide their inside bits. So it's m divided by n in this case. When we add them, we multiply them. Okay. It's important to note if there is an A or like a capital A out the front, or probably a better one to choose is B, there is a capital B out the front. Um, we actually need to put that inside the bracket. So we've got log of A of M to the power B plus log A power N. And then we multiply like this. Okay. So super important though um, to, to know that. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, if we have one over m, we can convert that to m to the power negative one, right? And then use the same sort of rule from here and put the negative one out the front. Um, another one is that if we have log a of anything of one, that's equal to zero. Why? Well, because a to the power zero is equal to one, right? And so we sort of, when we take the log, we're trying to ask, you know, what that zero was or like what that power was to get one. Well, any, like any number to the power zero is always one. And you know, so that's why the log there is zero. Another interesting property is that the log a of any number, right? Um, the, the log a of b, right? only works if b is greater than zero, right? Um, why? Well, we sort of looked at that with the um, exponential, right? We saw that the, the normal exponential of y is equal to a to the power x, right? Has a sort of like, um, you know, asymptote at zero to, like, you know, the range is only from zero to infinity of this because we can't reduce this below zero, right? 
because there is no x value that causes um, this to be equal to zero. It's the same deal with this. Um, if I sort of try to figure out what this is asking, again, we've got a to the power b is equal to c, right? The output of this is equal to c, right? Um, if um, if b, um, oh, I don't think b was meant to be um, equal to zero. Have I done this wrong? Oh, yeah, sorry. I have everything in the wrong spot. Um, sorry about that. I think this should have been a to the power c is equal to b. Right, yeah, my bad. Um, so with like we sort of talked about, there is no number that I raise to some value that can be equal to zero. Right? If we look at the four to the power of c sort of scenario, there is no value for c that will result in an answer of zero. Right. So hence, that's why b in this thing here must be greater than zero. Hopefully, that makes some sense. Okay. Um, let's have a crack at this. Um, again, have a go um, as well, um, and then you can sort of watch me work through it in the meantime. Um, it's also important to note that log base E, right, and so log base of Euler's number, can also be represented by this ln, and that means natural log, right? So E is known as, you know, um, like a super special value, so that's what we call the, the log base of E, the natural log, okay? So all written as ln. So I definitely recommend writing it as ln because if you somehow um, like you know don't write the e as a base clearly and write it like this, you can get marked down. So try not to do this, and it's always you know really important to, to either write it like this or this. Make it clear that e is the base, and I think the easiest way to do that is just use ln because it's like universal. Anyone will see ln and know that it's just the natural log, and it's also two letters as opposed to four. Okay, anyways. Let's try to simplify this expression. We've got 2 ln of a minus ln of a divided by 3. Okay, so first thing I reckon is to move this into the brackets, right? So we've got ln of a squared minus ln of a over 3, right? Then we can divide these two, right? Because it's a subtraction, the insides divide. So ln of a squared divided by a over 3. Oh, oops. So since this is a fraction, right, when we divide fractions, we need to flip this. So this is just ln of a squared times 3 over a. Right here, the a and the 2 will cancel out, and we're left with the natural log of 3a. We can't simplify it any more than that, so we just leave it as is. Um, so hopefully you guys got that. Um, well done if you did. Okay. Um, a logarithm is, you know, a logarithm function looks like this, right? So its general form is y is equal to log base b of x plus c plus d. So while the exponential function had a, uh, had a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to d, um, a logarithm has a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative c, right? Um, which is pretty neat. Um, and we'll sort of talk about why that's cool and when I talk about inverse functions. But why does this happen, right? So if x is equal to negative c, if this is equal to negative c, we get a log b of zero, right? And if you remember, I did say there, there, you know, this is not possible, right? Because we, we sort of showed that with um, an example as well. So that's why we have an asymptote there. So we can see that here we have an asymptote at x is equal to negative c right um so hopefully that makes sense here is just log base 2 of x shown um in order to work out that um, x intercept all we have to do is <coughs> all we have to do is um y is equal to zero so then zero is equal to log base 2 of x in order to get rid of the logs all you have to do is raise both sides to the power of 2 so we've got 2 to the power 0 is equal to 2 to the power log base 2 of x. Okay, and then these two cancel, and we'll talk about why they cancel in a sec. So we've got 2 to the power 0 is equal to x, and so then x is just equal to 1. Right, 
Okay, but why do these two cancel? What's you know what's happening there? All right. Um we'll go back one. Um so actually I'll just show one on this. So log base two of x, right? So the, the twos cancel. Let's think about what happens here. So if I have the log base of log base of a of b and that's equal to um I'm sorry, I'll just get rid of the b have a c there instead is equal to b, right? And a to the power b is equal to c, right? If I raise, you know, so these two statements are true, right? Now, if I take equation one and I raise both sides of it to the power a, I'll get a to the power log base a of c, and that's equal to a to the power b, right? And I also know that a to the power b is equal to c, right? So then I've got a to the power log a of c is equal to c. So that's effectively just cancelling out the a's and what I'm left with is now just a c. So hopefully that uh, makes sense, how we went from here to 2 to the power 0 is equal to x. Um, I've already mentioned why this asymptote exists. And this graph, why does it, you can't really see it with the writing, but basically says why does this graph approach this asymptote? Well, it's for the same reason as the... Um, exponential, right? As we get closer and closer to the asymptote, what happens is that value gets closer and closer to um, negative infinity. So that's why, you know, it approaches this asymptote, but it never can equal it. Okay, let's talk about the domain and range of the logarithm. So for those of you who have done inverses already, you would have probably noticed that logarithms are the inverse of an exponential function. The easiest way to tell is that if we rotate this diagram, right? If we rotate it by, um, if we just rotate it entirely, right, um, by 180 degrees, right, um, actually not 180, sorry, um, if we just rotate it by 90 degrees, so we're making the x-axis um, the the y-axis, and, you know, we're rotating it just so enough that the y-axis is now the, the x-axis after rotation, right? We'll notice that um, this just looks like a lot, uh, this looks like a standard exponential, right? It'll, it'll look like this. Well, I don't mean to have that um, flick at the end. I'll just get rid of that. Um, oh, not sure what I've done. Um, oh, okay, cool. Sorry about that. Um, I think I'll edit that out. Um, okay, so we can see that you know the these two are sort of an inverse of each other, right? Um, we can also see that this here has a y-intercept of zero comma one, and its x-intercept is one comma zero. So it meets that you know sort of um, condition of a um, inverse function. So that, you know the x and y-intercept swap. Um, and, you know, they, they sort of are just 90 degrees rotation of each other, a reflection along the y is equal to x line, more or less. Um, okay, so anyways, like I was saying, the logarithms are the inverse functions of exponential functions, right? And exponentials are the inverse of logarithms. So the max domain of this log will be the same as the domain, or as the range of an exponential. So the maximal domain of a, of a logarithm is the maximum is equals to the maximal range of a exponential. So that's just zero to infinity, and the maximal range of a logarithm is just the maximal domain of an exponential, which is just all real numbers. All right. So how do we sketch them? Well, first thing first, we find the vertical asymptote, and then we find the axis intercepts. And if there is only one axis intercept, right, then we choose a scale point. Um, to sort of, you know, scale the axes, figure out what that happens. A good example of a scale point is this, the 2 comma 1. That's a reasonable example of a scale point. Just any easy value to choose and sort of pick, right? After that, we can sort of figure out its shape, you know, which uh, which way is it pointing, and after that, we can just sketch. Finally, again, we just reread the question. Okay, let's do this one. Kind of weirdly tricky, but we'll sort of break it down. So we've got y is equal to ln of 1 over 2x, plus one, um, and this is equal to y is equal to um, 
ln of 2x to the power negative 1 plus 1, right? And this is just equal to y is equal to negative ln of 2x plus 1. Okay, um, so I'm left with a negative, right? So earlier we saw, um, I'll just go back all the way here. Earlier we saw y is equal to log base 2 of x, like a positive faces this way, right? So I have a negative here now. And so what that's done is that it's flipped it. So every y value is now negative, right? So I'm expecting my graph shape to be like this, right? But we can sort of figure that out um, after figuring out the x and y intercepts, okay? Yeah, I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, okay, so we can work out what the, the x and y intercepts are. So first thing I'm going to do is y is equal to 0, right? So I've got negative ln of 2x plus 1 is equal to 0, right? Um, now I can sort of um, rearrange. So I've got um, ln of 2x, negative ln of 2x is equal to negative 1. Um, multiply by negative 1 to cancel the negatives. And I've got ln of 2x is equal to 1. Um, I can raise both power sides to the power e. So e to the power ln of 2x is equal to e to the power 1. So then 2x is equal to e to the power 1. And then x is equal to e by 2. e by 2 is 2.71-ish, 2.72 divided by 2, which is about 1. So I can say that's here. Right, let's see e divided by 2 when y is equal to 0. Okay. Um, another thing to work out is my um, vertical asymptote, right? Here I can see that the vertical asymptote is whatever is being added to 2x. In this case, there is no addition to 2x, right? So my vertical asymptote is x is equal to um, 0, right? So I'm just going to sketch it through. It's always important to schedule um, vertical asymptotes, right, like so. Um, and I might, so for some other value, I might just choose um, x is equal to 1, right? So x is equal to 1 is just going to be y is equal to ln of, so negative ln, sorry, of 2 plus 1. Um, that doesn't really help me. It's probably not a good value to choose. Um, so generally, when you choose those values, you want them to result in some whole number, but it doesn't matter too much. So fairly certain that my graph shape is going to pass through like this, right? So if we just sort of sketch it out, and we're good to go. Cool. So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, we can sort of double check by looking at the shape of this. We know that it was reflected because there's a negative at the front, right? So it should be coming down like that, right? which is what we saw. Cool. So hopefully this makes sense. All right. Um, so now that we've sort of covered exponentials and logarithms, um, let's sort of talk about um, the unit circle. I'm going to quickly grab some water. I will be back. Okay. Um, all right, unit circle. Um, so generally, I think it's pretty well accepted that a circle has 360 degrees, right? <clears throat> so circle generally, generally accepted 360 degrees, right? Um, and so the first thing that they did with unit circles was to sort of screw with that and change it into a different unit. And so we now have this new unit called radians, right? So radians are a measure of angles. Right, so one radian is the angle required, you know, to frame an arc the same length as the radius. What does that mean in fancy talk? 
right? Like, you know, in, in normal English and not fancy talk. So if I have a circle, one, pretty wonky circle, but you know, it is what it is. Um, and I have some radius r, right? The circumference of this circle is equal to 2 pi r, right? And the total number of degrees in this circle are 360 degrees. Let's say I equate these two, right? So 360 degrees, the full revolution, let's say I equate that to the circumference, right? So we've got 360 degrees per, you know, full rotation of the circle, which makes sense. And so this is sort of my um, metal, right? Um, and so we say, you know, a full circle length is a full radian, okay? Or well, a full circle length is two pi radians, right? Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah, that's basically um, that summarized. Um, radians are generally denoted by a small c, so something like this. Um, but, you know, more or less no symbol is used, so you don't really need to. Um, in methods, um, you generally want to be giving your answer in radians and not degrees. Um, and they'll, they'll tell you when you need to include degrees, but primarily from this point onwards, I'd recommend setting your calculator in radians. Um, so I think for, I use the TI and Spile, but if you go into document and then settings, you should be able to change it from degrees to radians. And when you are giving an answer in degrees, you should always include, you know, the, the degrees symbol, which is just the circle. Okay. Cool. So hopefully, you know, this is the arc length, that's the radius, and one radian is just um, some measure of angle. Okay, so how do I convert from radians to degrees? So to go from radians to degrees, you multiply by 180 by pi, and to go from degrees to radians, you multiply by pi over 180, right? Okay, so let's talk about the unit circle. Um, so I know this is a very confusing diagram, but we're going to sort of just try and break it down into bit by bit. So the unit circle, as the name describes, is a circle where the radius is equal to 1, right? So radius 1, we can see that in that um, this triangle here, right? So what's neat is that if I make a triangle in this circle, right, so connect it from the origin to some, you know, edge of the circle, let's say these coordinates are some unknown coordinates, x comma y, right? I can sort of link this angle made to x comma y using SOKATOA, right? So, SOKATOA, right? It's written here. So, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So, the height of this triangle is y, and the length of this is just x, right? Because that's where the point corresponds to. So, um, sine of alpha is equal to opposite, so y over hypotenuse. Um, and hypotenuse in this case is just equal to 1. So sine alpha, oh, that's a horrible alpha, is equal to y. And cosine is equal to, so cosine alpha is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, which is just x over h, right? which is x over 1. So now we've shown here that x is equal to cosine alpha and y is equal to sine alpha. So every x value on this um, unit circle is represented by cosine of the angle made by, you know, that rotation. Same with sine, and that just corresponds to y values, right? Tan, on the other hand, is opposite over adjacent, right? So tan is y divided by x. Right, so that's tan alpha. Um, this is pretty neat. Basically, y is, you know, sine alpha, right? It's so sine alpha. And cosine is x, right? So here we show that tan alpha is equal to sine alpha divided by cosine alpha. So that's sort of another important relationship to know. So that's shown here. So knowing this, um, knowing that the x value is directly linked to sine and cosine and tan, we can see in this first segment here, we're going to call this quadrant 1, right? x and y are both positive, right? And because of that, sine alpha gives a positive value, 
cosine alpha gives a positive value and so does tan alpha. In quadrant two, we see that the x values are now negative, right? So x is now negative. Um, by the way, these pi on two, three pi on two, these are just angles, um, I should mention. Um, but really these intercepts here are one, negative one, and one, and negative one here, right? So in here, the x coordinates now have negative values. It's a negative x comma y in here. And so here we get cosine being equal to a negative value, sine still being positive, and tan being negative, right? Um, down here, we have both negative x and negative y, right? So you have sine being negative, cosine being negative, and since tan is a division of both, the negatives cancel out when we're left with tan is positive in quadrant three. Quadrant four, we have, again, a positive x, but a negative y. And so sine in this case, oh, it's the wrong thing that I was about to highlight. Um, sorry, sine in this case is negative, um, then cosine is positive, and tan, since it's a division, is negative. Okay. Um, and here are some sort of important rules to know. Okay. Cool. So hopefully this all makes sense. If it doesn't, um, just drop a question in chat and I'm more than happy to sort of walk through it. Okay. Um, how do we remember these, right? How, how is it, you know, how can we remember this? So in quadrant one, we sort of saw, saw that all sine, cosine, and tan, all three of them are positive. So here we can just write all positive. In quadrant two, we saw that only sine was positive. So we can write um, S, right? S for sine only positive. In quadrant three, we saw that both sine and cosine were negative. However, tan was positive. So we have a T for positive tan. And in quadrant four, same pattern sort of follows. Negative sine, positive cosine, negative tan. So you write C. So the easiest way to remember this is cast. Um, so C-A-S-T, starting from quadrant four, you want to go all the way around with cast. Okay. So how do we, you know, each, each angle, right, more or less has this ratio, right? And that ratio corresponds to an exact value. Okay, in some cases, more or less. So each angle, right, is going to create this triangle. And some of these triangles have measurable dimensions and they're not like, you know, um, insane values that only your calculator can do. And these are called exact values. So there are a few methods we can use to remember these exact values. Um, one is known as the table method and the other one is known as the triangle method. I personally use the table method and that's just memorizing this table um, whereas others, you know, might use the triangle method. So how does the table method work? What's the best way to remember the table method? So what I do is um, I assemble a table. So I just write sine, cosine, tan. Then I write the angles. So um, by the way, this is just zero degrees. Here is 30 degrees. Here is 45 degrees then 60 degrees and 90 degrees. So it's good to know the conversions of these radian values to their degrees. Right, just knowing them without having to do the calculation. Right, and so also after this, you've got pi, which is 180 degrees. Okay. Um, so what I like to do is write sine cos 10 and then 0, pi by 6, pi by 4, pi by 3, and pi by 2. And then for sine, all you do is just count from 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then we take the square root of everything, right? And then we just divide by two. And now simplifying these should give us our exact values represented here. For cosine, we start at four and we count to zero. So four, three, two, one, zero. Then again, same thing, divide, square root it all, then divide by two. Right, and finally for tan, we just use that rule from before. So tan is equal to sine divided by cosine, 
we just use that and work out what tan is. Right? So, um, here we would have one, and then here it's a half divided by root three on two, which is one by root three. Zero divided by a half is just zero. Um, root three on two divided by a half is just root three. And four over two divided by that, which is zero, is undefined. Right, because one over zero is undefined. Cool. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. And this is the triangle method. I don't have too much experience on the triangle method, um, but I guess in essence, it's just sort of memorizing these triangles. Um, and I wasn't too much of a fan of that. I just preferred, you know, knowing how to count to four and square rooting it and defining it. Okay. Um, we'll sort of try to evaluate the following here. So I'll give you guys some time, have a crack at it. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to show, sort of go through how we do it. So these aren't, you know, the exact values that we sort of showed here, but it sort of relies on the same understanding to be able to calculate these. So the first one is 10, 5 pi on 4. What I like to do is figure out where these angles are, right? So 10, 5 pi on 4 is about here, right? It's just slightly greater, right, than pi, right? It's greater than pi, right? Because 5 on 4 is greater than 1. And it's actually just pi on 4 greater than pi. So that, I can express tan 5 pi on 4 as pi plus pi on 4, right? And so this puts me in quadrant 3. That's a positive tan value, right? Interestingly, interestingly, if I look at pi on 4 as well, right, since they're both positive, they're the same value. So this is just equal to tan pi on 4. From just knowing my unit, you know, my um, exact values, tan pi on 4 is just equal to 1. So we can write that, and I'm done with that question there. Nice. Okay, what about sine negative pi on 3? It's a little bit more tricky. If I'm going negative, so generally the, the rule of thumb is if you're going anti-clockwise, that's positive in the unit circle. If you're going negative, that means you're going clockwise, right? So my angle is going to be here at negative pi on 3, right? So I've gone from 0 anti-clockwise, I mean clockwise, sorry. And this is in quadrant 4, right? Quadrant 4, sine is negative. And so all this... You know, all this means to me is that this is equal to negative sine pi on 3, right? Uh, pi on 3 um, from, you know, my exact value table is just root 3, root 2. But since it's got the negative because it's in quadrant 4, I write the negative at the front. Okay, what about cosine negative pi on 4? Well, cosine negative pi on 4 is, you know, still in quadrant 4. Right? So it's negative pi on 4, like so. Um... Just using C-A-S-T, right, C-A-S-T, which is what I've been doing for the others. Um, quadrant 4 is positive for cosine, right? So this is just equal to cosine pi on 4. It's the same thing because it's positive, right? And this is just equal to root 2 divided by 2. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, all right. So sometimes we have more than one variable, right? Like sometimes we're trying to solve for, um, you know, instead of solving for negative pi on four or something, we're trying to solve for a variable, right? And so some, you know, the the sort of, the, the easiest way to go about this is there's no easy way of going about it. It's still a tricky method. We need to sort of solve for it over some domain. I'm going to sort of walk you guys through how to do that. So, what we want to do is isolate this, right? So the first thing we do is, well, we have a domain from 0 to 4 pi, right? I can represent this like this. So 0 is, um, well, x is greater than, greater than or equal to 0, but less than 4 pi, right? Then I can sort of substitute um, the x on 2, um, x on 2 plus pi on 3 here. So first, I divide everything by 2, right? So 0 by 2 is just 0, 2 pi by 2, I mean 4 pi by 2 is just 2 pi, and I have x on 2 here. Then I chuck in the pi on 3 here. So I've got pi on 3 is, um, well, x plus x on 2 plus pi on 3 is greater than or equal to pi on 3. Um, 
but it's less than 7 pi on 3. So now I've changed my domain from 0 to 4 pi, right? I can try solve it. How do I go about solving it? Well, I need to look for values that are within this domain. Okay, what, what does that mean? Well, I need to solve for what this angle is. So I'm going to do inverse sine of root 3 and 2. So this is just working back from um, an output to the angle, right? Well, the output is root 3 on 2, which is positive. So I can either be a sine value in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2, right? That's what it's telling me. It, the quadrant 1 value for sine um, arc sine of root 3 on 2 is pi on 3. Right, so I can have pi on 3 here. Another value I can have is somewhere here. So what I like to do is I need to sort of be within this domain, right? The domain is from pi on 3 equal to pi on 3 to 7 pi on 3. 7 pi on 3 is like somewhere here, slightly more than pi on 3, right? Um, so I can sort of go around like this, right? And I can see I have two sort of solutions. I have the solution at pi on 3, and then I have a solution at pi minus pi, uh, 2 pi on 3, which is 2 pi on 3. And 7 pi on 3 is not included, so I don't have that as a solution, right? which is why it's eliminated here. And then I just subtract both uh, pi on 3 from both sides, and I get 0 comma pi on 3. Then I divide by 2 to get my final answer. Cool. Hopefully that makes some sense. All right. <clears throat> so how can I go about graphing these functions? because that's more or less what this section is about. So how can I go about graphing this? So what I can do is, um, you know, the, the, the easiest ones to learn to graph are sine and cosine. These both are very similar. So they have the same form and they're translated and transformed by the same amount. So the first thing to note is the axis of rotation. So the graph or the average value, the graph sort of is centered around y is equal to c, right? So it's the average value of the function. And it's sort of, you know, the graph always oscillates around this value. So we'll sort of see what that means. The amplitude is represented by A, right? And that's how far away it moves from C, right? The amplitude is always shown as positive, but um, it can push it a value up to negative 2 and then back down to up to 2 and then back down to negative 2. And the period is the length of a cycle or a length of a full oscillation. So it's basically how long... Um, the function takes to repeat its pattern. Right? We'll also look at what that means. Um, so here is just, you know, a sine graph, and here is just a cosine graph, right? <clears throat> you can see that they look the same. They're just sort of translated a little bit. So that's why, you know, they're, they're more or less the same function, just slightly translated, right? So we can see that the axis of, over, axis of rotation or the average value is at the center, this shows the amplitude, right? It can go above and it can also subtract from the center and go down, right? And the period is one full revolution. It needs to end and start in the same way. See how here, um, although these two points are technically, you know, um, at zero, right? If we look at the direction that the graph is moving, and the graph in this case is moving down, but in this case it's moving up, right? So the direction that the graph is moving in needs to be the same for a full period. Right, that pattern needs to be fully complete. So in this case, we have it moving down, and here we sort of have it, you know, reaching that same point and starting to move down. So that's also one period. So yeah, again, I'm just going to reiterate that the period is equal to two pi on n. It's very important to note. So how do we go about sketching these? Well. First, um, always determine your amplitude, your period, and your axis of rotation. Then you want to determine when your equation reaches its max points, or you know these points here, right? Um, well, after you work that out, um, you want to divide your period into four sections, um, and you you because generally you'll get four different key points, right? Um, and you can use that to sort of graph your um, graph, and we'll sort of do that in a bit. And then you want to calculate your x-intercepts if it's vertically translated. So the plus c also acts as a vertical translation. So in some cases, if it's vertically translated, you're going to have weird intercepts. You might have something like this. Right? So you might, you know, and this might be your new center there. So it's important to calculate those as well. 
Okay, so in this case, we've got um, the graph of y is equal to 2 sine 2x minus 1, right? So from the graph, we can see that the amplitude is 2. The period is equal to 2 pi on n. In this case, n is equal to 2. So this is just 2 pi by 2, which is just pi. And the center or, oh, oops, the center is at negative 1, right? So here we go. That's negative 1. The graph starts at negative 1, right? And it also ends at negative 1. So we've graphed one period. Um, we can note that the highest value of the graph is 2 minus 1, right? Which is equal to 1. And the lowest value of the graph is minus 2 minus 1, which happens at negative 3. Right? So here and here, right? In order for the graph to be at a maximum, the sine of 2x must be equal to 1, right? So it's sine times pi on 4 times 2, which is just equal to sine pi on 2, which is equal to 1. For it to be at a minimum, the sine must be equal to a negative 1, right? So we have to have sine. Um, we need to somehow make sine 3 pi on 2. The only way to make sine 3 pi on 2 from 2x, so if I've got 2x is equal to 3 pi on 2, right? x is equal to 3 pi on 4, which is why I have this part here. And in order to just solve for um, these points here, we equate y is equal to 0, and then we just solve as we would a normal trig equation, right? So we've got 2 sine 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. Um, rearrange, so we've got sine of 2x is equal to 1 on 2. Um, arc sine of this is equal to, um, so we'll end up with 2x is equal to arc sine of a half, right? And arc sine of a half um, from memory might be equal to, um, oh, start, um, in, in the chance that you do fit your period, like your, um, your like exact value table, um, easiest way to do it, just count, right? Um, I'm sort of mind blanking, so we've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Square root 1 and 2, it's likely that this is just pi on 6, right? Um, and so then I can sort of add this to my period, right? So we've got 2x is equal to um, pi on 6 plus, um, I think we calculated the period to be um, pi, right? So we've got n pi, because um, it's a repeating sort of value. This is a general solution. Um, and we can also have 2x is equal to 5 pi on 6 plus n pi, okay? And then from there, we can sort of work out what um, our values are. Um, if you're not entirely sure what a general solution is, a general solution is more or less um, where here, sorry, I'll just go back. We worked out it for a particular domain. We worked out the x values. A general solution allows us to work out the values over, um, like a lot, like over an infinite domain, um, and we just need to work out what the values for n could be. Okay, and so by just solving this, we would get five pi on twelve and pi on twelve as our two values within the domain. Okay. Um. Now, let's get on to sketching tan. Um, so tan has this general form here. So y is equal to a tan of nx plus c. So the period of tan is a little bit different now, right? We've got the period is equal to pi over n instead of 2 pi on n, right? And tan also has an asymptote. So if we go back to our exact value table, you would recall that there is a case where 1 over 0 happens, and that is undefined. So therefore, that's an asymptote, right? So tan is an asymptote whenever this thing here is equal to pi on 2, right? Because that's when tan's asymptote happens, or when, that's when it's undefined, right? So we generally solve for nx plus c is equal to pi on 2 when we're graphing this. And then we just add the period to it. Because this graph repeats every period, we can just add a period to it to find the next asymptote. Okay, let's have a go at graphing a um, tan function. So in order to sketch tan, um, simply all you do is um, first calculate the period and find the first asymptote. Then you want to sketch the asymptotes, and then you want to add or subtract the periods to find more asymptotes. 
and the x-intercepts will always be in between those two asymptotes um, at the halfway point. And so we'll sort of show you what this means. Um, so let's have a go at sketching y is equal to tan of x over uh, tan of x over two, for x is an element of negative pi to four pi. Right. So first thing I'm going to do is work out the period. The period is equal to pi on n, and in this case, n is equal to one half. Right. So this is equal to pi divided by one half, which is just equal to two pi. So they want us to graph it for about three-ish periods. Right. Then I'm going to set x over 2 is equal to pi on 2. So then x is equal to um, pi, right? That's my very first asymptote. Um, so I have an asymptote at pi. If I subtract pi, so x is equal to another asymptote I can have is pi minus 2 pi, which is at negative pi, or I can have one at pi plus 2 pi, right? So I would go graphing this, this is what it would sort of look like, right? So I've worked out the period to be two pi. Um, first asymptote is that x is equal to pi, right? So I've got that labeled here in this line here. So we've got x is equal to pi. Now, if I subtract two pi from that, I'll go to here, x is equal to negative pi, right? If I add two pi to that, I'll get x is equal to three pi. Now you guys can see perfectly that, you know, the um, the x-intercept lies perfectly in between pi and 3 pi, right? So it's the average of the two. So just adding them and then dividing them will give you your x-intercept, right? To work out um, this intercept, all you have to do is just add 2 pi to this, and you'll work out the next um, asymptote, which is outside of the domain, so which is why it's not, which is why it's not labeled. And so you can just do 3 pi plus um, 5 pi by 2, which is just 8 pi by 2, which is 4 pi. So hopefully that makes sense. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about different types of functions. Um, I feel like maybe you guys would have um, come across this before. If not, that is all good. Um, we'll sort of talk about what a one-to-one -one function is versus a not one-to-one -one function, I guess. So a one-to-one -one function happens when there are no y value repeats. So in order to do, do this, we use the horizontal line test. If you guys remember the vertical line test, so a line test going like this would determine if something is a function or not. In this case, both of these are functions because they pass the vertical line test. That is, they only have one intercept with the vertical lines, right? However, only this function here passes the one-to-one -one test, whereas this sine function does not pass the one-to-one -one test, right? So sine is not a one-to-one -one function because we can see as, you know, it makes two intersects um, or multiple intersects with a horizontal uh, line, right? Um, so for a function to have an inverse function, it must be one-to-one, -one, right? So that's super important. Um, if a function is not one-to-one, -one, what we can do is we can force it to become one-to-one. -one. We do this by changing its domain, right? For example, we have the graph f of x is equal to x squared, and this is not a one-to-one -one function, right? I can do the horizontal line test, it fails straight away. Um, but I, can, I can't inverse it like this. But I can inverse it if I restrict its domain from zero to infinity, because now it passes the horizontal line test. And now it can be um, inversed. Um, so there's sort of a mathematical way to inverse, and there's also a little bit more of an intuitive way to inverse, which is with, you know, graphically doing it. So how does that work? Well, an inverse function is a reflection across the line y is equal to x. I sort of mentioned this earlier, um, but that's more or less it, just a reflection across y is equal to x, right? So, um, and also another important thing to note is that inverse functions might intersect on the line y is equal to x. Generally, all of their intersections between these two functions happen at the line y is equal to x. So a really common question type is they'll get you to find the inverse of a graph, and then they'll ask you, well, um, what is the um, intercept between these, gra these two graphs? And oftentimes, you might have like square root of x and x squared, 
right? And solving these intersect, like solving this can sort of be annoying sometimes. Um, in this case, it's fine. Um, but there can be a little bit more tricky cases, right? And the easiest option to do is just solve this, right? Because if they are inverses, they will have intersections across y is equal to x. Um, and so just to recap, um, we sort of brought this up with um, the logarithms and stuff, but the domain of f is equal to the range of the inverse function, right? And the domain of the inverse function is equal to the range of the original function. So here we can see y is equal to x and two sort of inverse functions there. Um, how do we find inverse functions? Um, as you saw before, the, the function notation for an inverse function is f inverse or negative one. Um, the things you've got to do to find the inverse function is first write let y is equal to f of x and then write swap x and y or something like that. Um, and then you want to write like rewrite your equation um, of y is equal to f of x with x and y swapped and then rearrange and make y the subject, right? So let's have a go at this. So first thing I'd say is let, let y is equal to f of x, right? Um, swap x and y. So now we've got x is equal to negative 4y plus 7. Now we rearrange and solve for um, y. So we've got x minus 7 is equal to negative 4y, and now y is equal to x minus 7 by negative 4. So we've got negative 1 on 4 by x minus 7, and that is our inverse function. It's written out here as well. Now, leaving it like this is not... Oh, sorry. I realized I got, got in the way of it again. So we've got um, y is equal to x minus 7 minus 4. So then y is equal to um, negative 1 on 4 by x minus 7. Now, leaving it like this is not enough um, to sort of secure the mark. What you have to do is finally put it back into the function notation, more or less, like so. And then leaving it like this will give you the mark. However, leaving it in the form of like this will not because you've only said y is equal to f of x and not the inverse. Okay, um, now that we've done that, let's sort of talk about... Um, transformations. So there are three main types of transformations. We've got dilations, which stretch and squish, or well, stretch and squish. And we have translations, which move side to side, up and down. And we also have reflections, which, you know, reflect it in different axes, more or less. So a dilation of by a factor from the, the y-axis, right? So if we think about what that means, right, is so if I have a, you know, a graph like this, if I'm dilating it from the y-axis, I'm stretching it like this, right? Away or towards the y-axis, so this way. And so when I pull a function out like this, the only thing that's changing is not the y-value, the height is not changing, right? But the location of my hands in the horizontal plane is changing. So a dilation from y affects the x-values. However, a dilation, in, you know, by factor B from X, right? So away and towards X is pulling down or pushing up, right? So my function is being pulled up or squished down in this way. And so what changes here is not my X values, but rather my Y values, right? So a dilation from X directly affects my Y values, okay? A reflection in Y, Right, so if I'm a reflection in Y, it means I'm going from this to this, right? So here to oh, here, sorry, it's a little tricky, to here, right? So here to here, right? So I'm changing the X value as I'm shifting across Y, right? So hopefully that's sort of captured there. Um, and a reflection in X, right? I'm going from here to here. So here to here. So what's changing is my y values. So reflection in x affects y, a reflection in y affects x. Now translations in the positive and negative y direction affects your y values, right? Because if I translate up in y, it goes up. If I translate down in y, it goes down. 
Now, if I translate um, side to side, so negative or positive x direction, um, that obviously affects your x values because you're shifting side to side. Okay, um, there's a few methods to sort of do your um, <coughs> dilations, right? Uh, or translations and, or any transformations. The first one is the quadrant method, which takes a little bit longer, um, but you know it doesn't have as many room for errors. So that's a method I generally stick with. Even on my exam, I was using the coordinate method to sort of do all this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, so generally what we do is we apply the transformation to the, the values like this. Then we call the new values x prime and y prime. And then we substitute these into the original function and solve for y prime and x. Um, the replacement method is a little bit quicker, but requires memorization. And I don't like to use the replacement method. In my mind, it's always a shortcut method that I only save for double checking, right? So yeah, it's, it's really just derived from the coordinate method. So I'd recommend just doing the coordinate method and not really doing the replacement method too much.